Well, I wanted to give you guys an update about last weekend. Um, we are invited to go play music down in Washington, in Indiana, between Bloomington and uh, Terre Haute. In uh, Terre Haute or Evansville? Evansville? Anyway, way south. <clears throat> and um, had a, I didn't realize it was a Mennonite church until I got there. But uh, Friday night... Yeah, because I'm thinking, this is going to be weird. Because um, I think they used to be. They broke off from the Mennonite church. But um, they still have some of the same customs and traditions and stuff. But they're pretty accepting of people, which is really kind of neat. Because I had a friend of mine, Bobby, was there. He spent 30 years in the penitentiary. He was a lieutenant in the Aryan Brotherhood. And... Um, got saved, got out of prison, and he's, he does a lot of evangelism now, and, um, (laughs) he's a big dude, he's got his big goatee, and, and, uh, always wearing shorts, and, uh, he's something else, he's a trip, but, uh, then also, another friend of mine was there, Little Wolf, who's the, uh, national chaplain for the Outlaws Motorcycle Club, he spent 40-some years in the Outlaws, and five years in the state penitentiary, and got saved, Matter of fact, he got saved. His salvation experience started when he went to go check on this ex Hell's Angel that was giving his testimony at a church in Oklahoma. So he goes and rolls over there because he's like, What's this guy doing in our territory? Right? It's our enemy. So he goes over there and he listens to the guy. He was like Nicodemus. He's like, You know, you almost convinced me, you know, to get saved. Well, he ended up getting saved later. But uh, he was there. So, you know, we all got to kind of give our testimonies, and and um, and they were they were so hospitable and loving. It was so cool. No, not judgmental. Um, we sang Sunday night or Friday night. I sang Saturday, and then so they asked me to preach on Sunday. Believe that. So yeah, me either. <laughs> I was like, not after finding out, you know, this is a Mennonite, basically Mennonites. You know, and anybody that knows me, this is like really dressed up, you know, and I was wearing a Harley t-shirt and jeans and boots in their church Sunday morning, (laughs) you know, it's just, that's what I brought, you know what I mean? So I didn't know I was preaching. So, uh, got to give the word on Sunday and, um, it was really neat because it talked about unity and, um. It was really cool to to just see how we just people just come together, and I told him I said you know I said you look at you look at us and you think man what a miracle that these guys got saved, you know especially guys have been to prison, you know they were high ranking officers in the AB in the Aryan Brotherhood, Outlaws Motorcycle Club, all these guys that <clears throat> you know from rumor are pretty rough characters, and. Um, and you guys just love it on us, you know, just like we're family. And uh, it was really funny because I heard a story on my way back. I got a call from Bobby. He goes, hey, man. He goes, Ammon called me, and he was telling me that he went into church that Sunday morning, and he's like, man, these guys are, are the real deal. And they're like, what do you mean? He said, man, I walked in there Saturday morning to pick them up. We were supposed to go to breakfast at 9. They'd been up since 7 in a Bible study. I got there at 7.30. We didn't get done till 9.00. Because, I mean, you wake up and they're like, hey, let's have a Bible study. I'm like, yeah, let's do this, you know. So we're in there fellowshipping and having a Bible study. And it was a blast, you know. And I, I guess they weren't really expecting that out of these three weirdos, you know. And um, it was fun because it was like family. We're just everybody laughing, carrying on, and picking on each other and just having a good time. It's like I was hanging out here, you know, and um, which – I don't see that going out when I go out. I don't see that kind of everywhere you go. And that was, I didn't really expect it there. But they invited us to a lunch on Sunday, and I was just going to come home. I was planning on coming home Saturday. I was just going to come home afterwards because it's a five-and-a-half-hour drive. They're like, well, why don't you come over for dinner? Because every Sunday they all get together. Everybody in the Wegler family gets together, and they bring a dish to pass, and they all go to one person's house and the next. You know, throughout every day, alternate every week. 
So we're like, okay, that'd be cool. We'll go grab something to eat and then head home. So we get over there. And before they eat, I was sharing with the guys, before they eat, they sing. And Ammon told me, he goes, hey, we sing a cappella at church. And I'm thinking, yay. You know what I mean? You know. And uh, But when I got there, they break out the hymnals. And I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. But everybody sings their part. The sopranos sing the lead part. The altos sing their part. The guys sing the tenor and the bass parts. And it is amazing. I took me back to school. I said, you guys took me to school today. And they're like, they just kind of looked at me. I said, listen, I haven't sang like that since choir. And I was like, so I had to think, you know, all right, what is my note? What does my note sound like? Where am I at, you know? And because uh, you can sing any song. You don't have to know it. You know your part, you know. And um, it was cool. It sounded really neat. And um, then when they got done singing, then they, then they prayed, and then we ate. And um, they told they said, the Ammon's wife, Marty, her name's Martha, she goes by Marty, she says, Dave, she goes, we want you to know that we love you guys and that you're part of our family. So when we have family get-togethers, we're going to get hold of you. We want you to come. She says, my kids adore you guys, and they want you to be at all, whatever events they have going on. And I'm like, well, that's cool. I mean, I don't know why they care, but that's pretty sweet. So it was really neat. But I'm going to play something for you. I played it for the guys. This is a song that they sang before. I got to find it here, sorry. Before dinner. And I'll put it up by the microphone. It'll look weird, but. I'm ready when you are. I told them I had to record it. Sort of stand there going. That was cool. I was like blown away because I'm like, I'm all about instruments and harmonies and stuff, but I was just blown away because when Ammon's, yeah, that was at, that was at the Wegglers. Yeah. Every time they sing first and then, no, when they get together as a family, I don't know. I'd be kind of cool if they would, because I would go. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Melinda's really, I think she's mocking you now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put up with that, man. No. That would be cool, though, if they did. That would be pretty fun. And, <laughs> you know, Melinda did tell me that last Sunday you were a really bad influence on her. So I don't know what that means, and I didn't get into detail. I was just, whatever. But when we were there on Friday night, you know, I was telling you that Amish girl had talked about, um, you know, well, I don't know if I told you the Amish girl, but. There's an Amish girl, she's 40, her and her husband were there on Friday night to listen to us play, listen to the music and, and testimony, and and um, she said, ever since I was a little kid, I've had this fascination for Harley Davidson's, and like from the time she was 10 or 12 years old, she said she would lay in her yard and lay down on the grass and listen to the Harleys rumble down the highway three miles away. She always had this fascination, and I'm a lot of school, and um, she always wanted to go for a ride on a Harley, but... The Amish community said that you ride you ride a motorcycle, you're going to hell. So Bobby goes, Do you want to ride one tomorrow? 
She's like, really? And she started getting really giddy, which, I don't know, tickled me, man. I was like, I was as excited for her as she was. So she shows up on Saturday. We're at a campground, and I was playing some music there. And um, she shows up. She drives up in her husband's truck because she's not Amish anymore. And um, she gets out, and her husband, Aaron, I was like, dude, it takes a lot for you to say, yeah, go ahead, honey. I don't know these idiots. That one guy you're riding with has been in prison for 30 years. And, um, but, hey, yeah, go ahead. Knock yourself out. I got the kids. I'll, I'll take care of them when you, when you never come back. But, anyway, she shows up, and she is so excited. She doesn't know how to put a helmet on. So she gets a helmet. She puts it on. And I help her. I show her how to do it. I put it on for her and show her how to, how to do it. And she's just bubbling. And... Um, she gets on the bike, and, you know, Bobby gives her a few instructions, and they take off. And Bobby doesn't just take off. Bobby kicks it down the road. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and, and our buddy, the other friend of us, Little Wolf, he's ripping right beside him. And they come back, and Bobby says, to, told me later, he goes, she asked me if she could raise her hands up while she was going down the road. And I'm like, do whatever you want. She's back there with her hands up in the air like she's riding a roller coaster. <laughs> when she comes back. And I showed the video to the guys. You guys seen it? She was so giddy, you know, and which really lit us all up. Well, Sunday I was preaching and I was talking about unity and I was talking and, and I said, you know, we even got to take an ex-Amish person for a ride on a Harley Davidson this weekend. This has been awesome. And I didn't say her name. I didn't want to call her out. And we get done and, uh, she raises her hand. She goes, hey, I, I want to say something. So she gets up, and they're pretty free, which is really cool. I like how they're pretty laid back. And she says, she was talking about her childhood and how being in the Amish, she was in bondage, you know, with a lot of things. And she's really been dealing with the, um, dealing with how her, her family relates to her now. And every time they say something, try to put a guilt trip on it, on her, it really bothers her and stuff. Well, <clears throat> I'd sent her pictures of her on the motorcycle in the video. And uh, <laughs> I guess she put it on, on social media. Not the, I don't know if she put the video on there, but some pictures. Well, some of her family seen it. Well, I'm like, what are you Amish hanging out on Facebook for? You know what I mean? Hypocrites. Anyway, um, so they give her some grief about it. And she goes, you know, it didn't bother me. She said, this weekend I was set free. I'm gonna, I'll read a text that she sent to me. And, uh, I mean, it just touched my heart because you never know how God's working in people's lives. <clears throat> and Mary says, this has been one of my happiest days. Something deeper happened and I praise God. She said, I was set free. And I was like, that is awesome. And then she sent me a picture of her and I and, and Aaron, her husband. And they're just, they're just cool people. Well, I'm, I'm going to go buy her a Harley shirt and send it to her. I don't know if they'll let her wear it, but send it down there anyway. I've got their address. So I'm like, hey, they blessed us for coming down there. So we'll use their church money to do it. <laughs> <coughs> hey, why not? It's mine now. Anyway, it's the Lord's. But uh, it was really cool because... I, I kind of gave my testimony before I got into the got into the scripture. And it was strange because Ammon asked me, he says, would you preach tomorrow? And I'm thinking, on what? <laughs> you know what I mean? He goes, every preacher's got at least one sermon in them. And I'm like, not really a preacher, but all right, whatever. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you want me to talk about. I'm just kind of flat-footed here. But hey, you open the door. It's on you anyway. So he gave me an outline, and my outline was like, I mean, 10 minutes tops, normal. Well, preached for an hour. I was like, man, Lord, that was crazy. Because you just kept, Holy Spirit just kept moving. Well, I was kind of talking about my testimony and about, you know, getting saved and not being, not having any discipleship. And going through that, some of you guys have heard that before. And and um, afterwards, this lady come up to me, and she said, you told my story today. I was like, really? What do you mean? 
And she goes, I don't even know. She's like, I'm not even, I don't even know if I'm really saved right now. I said, well, hold on. I said, she goes, because it all stems from her Sunday school teacher beating this verse in her head that talks about someone standing before the Lord and, and saying, well, I did this and I did this and I did this for you, Lord. And the Lord looks at him and said, I don't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, right? And that's scared her to death her whole life. I said, hold on, I'm going to take you somewhere. So I took her to Ephesians chapter 1. And I said, here's what I want you to do. First, I started reading it to her. And um, I'm going to flip there right now just to kind of give you so you'll know what was said. Ephesians chapter 1. Um, you know, I went, I went, I basically read the almost the whole first chapter, but verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound outward, toward, or abound toward us in, in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. And then I went over to, let me see, oh, verse 13. It says, in him, I read through this whole thing, but I got to verse 13, and, I, and it says, in him you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed by the, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And I said, now, you trusted in Jesus Christ, right? She said, yes. After you heard the word, after you heard the gospel, right? Yes. I said, you believe that, right? She said, yes. I said, when you believe that, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does that say? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You can't have the Holy Spirit if you're not saved. I said, who is the guarantee of your inheritance? Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Redemption by who? Until you get to heaven. To the praise of the glory of God. I said, you're sealed. I said, if you strayed from God right now, the, whole, the Holy Spirit would chase after you. Why? Because you don't belong to the devil. Or he just let you go. Whatever, you're not mine anyway. You don't belong in my flock. But no, he's going to chase after you because God's a jealous God. And he's going to bring you back by whatever means necessary. You don't do that when you're not his. That's not going to happen if you're not his. And I said, what I want you to do is, I said, I want you to read this book. Read that, that book of uh, Ephesians. I said, but before you read it, I want you to pray. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of that book to you. I said, because the Bible tells us that the, whole, that the Holy Spirit will reveal all truth to us. And he's not a liar. God's not a liar. This book is not a lie. So when you do that, it will happen. I said, pray that and start studying. Start reading it. Take your time. Let it sink into your soul. I said, because you have no fear. I said, that verse was not for you. It was for the person that was playing Christian their whole life, never surrendered to God, never surrendered their heart and soul, their life to Jesus Christ. They were just playing Christian. Well, I did all this stuff. I worked my way. No, you didn't. Get out of here. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus would say, you know. So it was really interesting because <clears throat> she's probably probably our age. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, she's just a puppy, Dan's age. And, uh, and it was really cool, man, because you don't ever really see what God does in people's lives. But sometimes he gives you a little glimpse of what he's doing. And I was telling the folks there, I said, listen, I said, you might think that it's a miracle that some of us got saved, that it's a really big deal. I said, but it's not. It's a miracle, yeah. But we're not the biggest miracle in this room. We already knew we were sinners because we practiced it, right? I said, but those of you that lived a really good life growing up didn't get into trouble. You were good people, good kids, good, good adults, good parents. For you to realize that you were a sinner and needed a Savior, that's a huge miracle. 
Because you're already good. Do you need, what do you need Jesus for? I mean, I'm going to go because it makes me feel good, you know? We continue doing good because it makes me feel good. <clears throat> I said, there was a girl we knew in high school. I always thought she was safe. She's a great kid, a great person. She didn't get saved until after high school. Blew our minds. Remember that, Lois? Love that girl. She's just one of those, I don't know, model children, you know, that we didn't like because they were always perfect. Her and Melinda. And, uh, but, uh, she didn't get saved till after high school. I said, so the big miracle in, to me is seeing you here, seeing you, seeing those of you that have accepted Christ, because I know you, a lot of you have not witnessed the things that we've witnessed and not been involved in the things we've been involved in to whatever degree. So that's a big miracle to me. And, um, so it was, it was really, it was an amazing time. You know, we got to, got to fellowship, you know, and uh, be able to meet more of the family of God that we'll get to hang out with in heaven, you know. It was really cool. So I wish you could all be there. You can all come anytime. You're always invited, everyone. So we can make it a big party whenever I go out. We'll all go. We can make it a, a big, huge Attack, get a short bus. Yeah, we'd need a short bus. Andy, Andy'd have to drive. But um, anyway, I wanted to share that with you because it was such a blessing. Um, thank you. I'm just thankful for my wife going, hey, yeah, that's fine if you want to hang out. And not having any issues with me being gone again for three days. Yeah, I did see your emojis. Thank you. Tracy, Tracy sent me one that supposedly looked like her. I said, that's not you. She's got too many teeth. So she sent me another one. <laughs> so I asked one, I said, did Tracy listen to last Wednesday? She's like, I don't think so. I said, did you tell her? No, I don't. No, you didn't tell her. So I kind of wasted a good one there. But uh, <laughs> so anyway, let's get into, let's get into the word. Uh, <laughs> Ron, would you open us up in prayer? Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 11. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable to those who see the sun. For wisdom is a defense as money is a defense. But the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what she has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. I have seen everything in my days of vanity. <laughs> there is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp this, and also not remove your hand from the other, for he who fears God will escape them all. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of a city. There is not a just man on earth who does, who does good and does not sin. So do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. All this I have proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? 
I applied my heart to know, to search and seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. Here's what I've found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I've found, but a woman among all these I have not found. Truly this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. <clears throat> go back to verse, <clears throat> verse 11. Wisdom is good with an inheritance. Wisdom is also good as an inheritance. Because wisdom is a source of wealth, just as an inheritance is. And it's profitable to those who are of the living. <clears throat> so we've noticed that as we're listening to Solomon talk in this book, you know, he's, he's always talking about those who see the sun or those under the sun. And he's always talking about those in reference to those that are alive. But with wisdom, verse 12, with wisdom, you can protect yourself against moral and spiritual attacks. And with money, you can protect yourself against physical and financial losses. In Colossians 2.13, it says, In Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ equals that life. 13, who can change the will of God? Who can change the will of God? Anybody? Nope, no one. 14, it says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that no man can find out nothing that will come after him. So God's allowed for us to experience times of prosperity and times of adversity. We've all been through that. We've all been through times where we had much. We've all been through times where we didn't have a whole lot of anything. And Solomon's telling us to enjoy the good and understand that the good and the bad are important, just as important. So they're for us to experience and to thank God for his provision as we go through both times, both situations. We never know when this is going to show up in our life. We never know when we're going to have a lot, when we're going to have a little. Paul said to be content in whatever state we're in. He said that he's had a lot and he's had, he's had very little. He said, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. We're not going to know what happens when we're gone. We're going to have no idea. He said, I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There's a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. We've heard the saying, well, I've seen it all, or I've seen everything. You know, after you see some goofy, crazy thing go on, well, now I've seen it all. Usually Andy's doing something, probably. And Deb's going, now I've seen it all. And many times we've heard that saying. We've seen all kinds of craziness in our lives, and I think Solomon's commenting on on that here in his day he's seen people that were good people die young and evil people live to a ripe old age and i think we've asked that question a few times in our own lives it's like why why are the good people passing away early and you got some crotchy old person that's just meaner than a snake lives to be 100 you know and it's just hard to understand he goes on he says, do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? See, Solomon didn't see the relationship between righteousness and blessing. And sin and punishment. See, he, he decided that the best route to take was to avoid extremes. And this is known as the law of the golden mean. 
So by avoiding extreme righteousness and excessive wisdom, you might escape premature destruction. It makes absolutely no sense to me. But we know that isn't true. Another danger was extreme wickedness. The foolish man can also be cut off before his time. We know as believers we aren't, we aren't to give in to wickedness at all. And he's, so this middle of the road idea isn't for us as Christians. You know, he's like, well, don't be too much of a sinner. Don't be too righteous. Uh, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard, well, I heard a preacher not too long ago talk like that. Well, don't, don't get too far into this sin. It's like, why don't, don't get into it at all? You know, where's victory here? How do you overcome sin? Deny the flesh, right? Take up your cross daily, daily, daily. Well, yeah, yeah, right, true. Usually in the union shop. (laughs) I know, me too. That's where I came from. Slow down, you're making us look bad. No, I'd like to get this job done. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, be moderate at all things. <laughs> That's true. Verse 18. It is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other for he who fears God will escape them all. According to Solomon, the best policy is to, is to grasp that fact of mediocrity, I guess. Grasp that fact of, no Siri, I'm not talking to you. Grasp that fact of, or the idea that it shouldn't be too much of this or too much of that. Well, he even, all this is coming from, from a humanistic viewpoint. So, I mean, it's not even getting into... It's not getting into the spiritual mindset whatsoever. So from the viewpoint of, of, of life on earth, that's where he's coming from. And, well, I mean, he goes on to talk about how, you know, we call him the wisest man. I mean, he really, he, he knew more than anybody we have in history here. But he also admits that he really isn't that wise as we go on. So the untimely fate of the over-righteous man and the self-destruction of the wicked, the one who fears God by walking in the middle will escape both pitfalls. <laughs> like, really, dude? Said, so, do you think God wants us to be moderately sinning or moderately righteous? I don't think it says that in the Bible anywhere. Be body, moderately righteous. Yeah. God wants, what's that? Well, exactly. Right. I will spit you out of my mouth. Well, yeah, there's no fence. I experienced that. Let me tell you about it. Tell you what God said to me. 19, wisdom strengthens the wise more than rulers of the city. So Solomon believes that wisdom gives more strength and protection to a man than 10 rulers give to a city. So wisdom is greater than military force, is what he's saying here. Verse 20, for there is not a just man on earth who does, not, who does good and does not sin. The word for, it says for there is not a man. That connects this verse with the verses prior to that. What's the connection? Well, we all need the benefit of wisdom that Solomon has been discussing. We're imperfect. All of us are imperfect. We all sin. We all fall short of perfect righteousness. But we are counted as righteous through Christ. By, but our ability to live out that is pretty lacking, right? <coughs> Jesus counts us as righteous. But none of us hit that mark. But only through the blood of Jesus Christ are we seen as complete. So we need to die to our flesh every day. We have to make a conscious decision every day to say, to say no to our flesh. 
and spent a lot of years training our minds to say yes. And now we got to do different. It's not always easy. All this I have proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. We have a healthy understanding of our failures. It will keep us humble. And when we're given criticism, we'll accept, be more accepting to it, towards it. It says, oh, I skipped a verse, sorry. I'm sorry. Do not take heart. I was reading the wrong verse. Do not take heart to everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. So if we have a healthy understanding of our own fails, failures, it, it keeps us humble. And when we're given criticism, we'll, we'll be more willing to accept it. So if someone's talking about us in a negative way, we'll just be glad they don't know everything about us. Right? They'll probably never shut, shut up. I know they wouldn't with me. They're over here talking smack about me. Well, Dave did this. Dave said this. Dave acted like this. I'll be like, cool, that's one thing. <laughs> nah, you ain't getting any more information because this will never end. This conversation will go on and on and on and on. And that's true about all of us. And, you know, the, one of the most difficult things to do is to be transparent with each other. But it does build strength. And, and that fear of somebody knowing you, knowing what you deal with, what you've dealt with, the struggles that you have, you think, well, if my brothers and sisters or my brothers knew, really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. You know, judgment would kick in. And they'd be like, no, you're good. You probably should leave. You know, <laughs> we can't. That's, that's a little bit more we can handle. But it's interesting because when <clears throat> we don't give in to that fear and we share with each other, there's a bond that grows. I had a friend of mine come to me one day, and he's like, listen, man, I really need to talk to you about something I'm struggling with. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because for me, it's like, I don't know if I want to hear this, you know. But then he's sharing things with me, and I totally could relate to what he was going through because I'd been through it myself, you know, and I'm like, there's no judgment here, man, you know? And he was afraid that if I knew that, how, what would my reaction be? How would I feel about him? What would I think about him? And all it did is make us closer because I'm like, I've struggled that before. I get it. And uh, it's not easy. And I understand where your heart's at. And I appreciate you coming to me because that's amazing because I never went to anybody. You know, I went to the Lord, but I mean... I didn't go to another brother and go, hey, man, I'm struggling with this. Will you pray for me? What can I do? You know, I battled that on my own. I mean, the Lord walked me through it. But to be, God wants us to share our burdens with each other. So, and it's not an easy thing to do. 22 says, for many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. Hmm. Many times we've been guilty of the same actions. We can't really expect anybody else to be different than we are. You know? All of this I have proved by wisdom. And I said, I will be wise. But it was far from me. Now I'm at the verse I said earlier. <laughs> Solomon used his wisdom to look at all these areas in life, and he wanted to figure out all these mysteries that he had uncovered, but he couldn't. Without God revealing truth to him, he was at a loss. Life was to remain an unsolved puzzle. I mean, how do you understand it? Twenty-four S for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? There's so many questions that can't be answered to life. And this world is so full of unexplained mysteries. I mean, you start looking into just the makeup of a plant or a human being. 
or just the creation of a child and all the stages they go through. I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. There's so many things that, that are just hard to explain. How does this happen? Twenty five, he says, I applied my heart to know, to search out and seek out wisdom and reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and madness. Because you know, earlier on, when we were earlier um, chapters, I don't remember which one it was, but we were talking about you know the same thing, how he was he was trying to understand that, right? Even though Solomon didn't find the answers, he gave all he had in search for greater wisdom and to find a solution to life. He wanted to understand the wickedness of foolishness and the lack of good sense and madness. Well, some of that stuff I don't think I'd really care to know, you know, but he sought after that. And he says, and I find more bitter than death a woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. Now he uses this picture of a, of a prostitute or, or a loose woman who can influence a man's desires. She's more bitter than death. She has ways of, of snaring men, and these men are in bondage to her. Anyone whose desires to please God will escape her traps, but the man who gives in to the sin will be sure to cross her path and be entangled in her web of perversion. This woman could be a type of the world or of the wisdom of the world. Nevertheless, it serves as a warning. Verses 27 through 29 says, Which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. I'm sorry. Here's what I have found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. Truly this only I have found, that God man made man upright, and that they have sought out many schemes. So through those verses, it seems to express Solomon's kind of disappointed with people. No one he has met was living up to his expectations. So out of all the men that he had known, how many were true brothers? How many were true friends? He discovered that good men are rare and good women are rarer still. Well, look at Solomon. How many wives did he have? How many concubines did he have? So that kind of tells you his whole focus towards women. You know, when you've got a thousand, really. One's plenty. No one met his expectations. He He couldn't find a woman among all these. And that statement seems a little bit harsh, but based on, a little harsh based on our Christian principles. But remember, Solomon wasn't, he wasn't coming from that mindset of, of Christianity or, or belief in God. He was coming from, the, from that worldly mindset. And remember, Orthodox Jews, they get up and pray every morning, thanking God that they weren't born a Gentile or a woman or I mean, that was their mentality back then. And some cultures today still look at that, look at women as property. And many commentators try to soften Solomon's words here because they are pretty harsh. But the fact is, Solomon probably meant what he said. His view of, of, of women at that time was probably not real high. And this is, book is written from a human understanding of life. But we do know that Solomon goes on to write a beautiful tribute to womanhood in Psalms 30, or Proverbs 31. And we know that was given to him by divine revelation. 29, man has fallen from our original condition. Once upright, made in the image of God after his likeness, but man sought out many sinful schemes. And these schemes distorted and damaged the divine image of man. So even in our imperfect, imperfect, I can't even speak, imperfectness, imperfectness, we seek perfection in our things, we, in our relationships, in our spouse, our jobs. We want the perfect job, the perfect house, the perfect kids, the perfect wife, 
the perfect husband. We never find it. Because we're not. So there's only one who was and is. His life on earth was lived with perfection. And now he's in heaven, exalted at the right hand of the Father. And that's Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he alone can satisfy our hunger for perfection. He is what fulfills our emptiness. He soothes our hurts and heals our hearts and minds. Without Christ, we get caught up in that whole mentality. Always chasing after something that we can never attain. Things. Because that's all that there is to satisfy our soul. Is the, like we spoke earlier in chapter, might have been chapter 7. Buying more things, getting more things. Chasing after the next greatest thing. And we see that in Christian life. It's like Christians can't be satisfied with this right here. They got to chase after some extra biblical something coming from someone to make them feel more spiritual without getting in the Word and studying, taking the easy road. This book continues to be a little depressing. Solomon is just bringing out the heart of man. He's just exposing the heart of man. And it's, it's a good reminder to us of where we came from. It keeps our hearts and minds focused on who brings us that peace and that comfort and who brings us that satisfaction. We don't have to chase after things to satisfy our lives. Because Jesus did that for us. He's the satisfaction in our life. He's the reason we're content. Now, it doesn't mean we don't get discontent. Because sometimes we do. Because we fight this flesh every day. But I just want to encourage you to... Uh, just be thankful for where God's brought us. And um, knowing that Christ gave us that gift of salvation and we don't have to battle a lot of these things. These temptations and, and uh, we know that the wisdom of God is, is a wonderful gift. We're going to close and then we're going to get into our prayer time. And, um, it's good to be back. Good to be home. Share with you guys. Spend time with you guys in, in prayer and prayer.